We started the uh, the week on a uh, note about the legislature that couldn't shoot straight. I'm sorry, the legislature that couldn't tax straight. And uh, really, actually, they they tax pretty effectively. In Washington State, 12 taxes, uh, either new or hiked up uh, uh, previously enacted taxes this past year. And of course, in Washington State, there it was a ballot initiative that requires, since they, the legislature refused to abide by a two-thirds to raise taxes measure, uh, they have uh, passed what they could pass by statute, which was to require that if the legislature doesn't either pass it by two-thirds or put it to a vote of the people, which to me seems like the proper way to raise taxes, uh, if there is such a thing. And, uh, um, but, but if they do raise taxes, don't send it to a vote of the people, uh, there's an advisory vote. And there have been 19 advisory votes on taxes since this, this was passed in 2007. And they've been mixed. Uh, 12 times they've said, no, we don't like that tax. Seven times they've said, uh, we're okay with it, at least the majority. And it seems to me to be a very helpful feedback loop, uh, a way to maybe engage the public into even though, you know, maybe it's just too cumbersome to have them vote on the actual tax, let's at least get the, a reading. And what is amazing is that there was a column uh, that, uh, uh, and the columnist Jerry Cornfield uh, with the News Herald in, uh, in Everett, I'm sorry, the Everett Herald, not the News Herald, uh, basically took the Democratic legislature to task, the majority controlled by Democrats, for not passing a bill that would have done away with these advisory votes. Now, Tim Iman, who's the initiative guru, the anti-tax activist, uh, he's passed a number of different measures, everything from car tab taxes to uh, auditor, uh, empowering the auditor, all kinds of things that the powers that be don't like. Um, but to have a newspaper columnist berating the legislature for not silencing the people on taxes just struck me as so bizarre. You would think that someone working in the press is all about let's shine a light on things. Let's find out where the public really is. But people don't care where the public is. I've found that a lot of politicians uh, don't care where they are unless they're trying to dodge them. <laughs> then they want to know where they are so they can be somewhere else. And to find that media people don't care where the public is. Uh, I, I have always thought of myself as a cynic and I have said many times since moving to Washington, uh, unfortunately decades ago to the Washington DC area, that I've never managed to be as cynical as I should be, uh, having seen what I've seen. And it, it's stuff like this, it's just a little thing. It's advisory votes, it's not everything in the world, it's not a life or death issue. We have politicians who don't give a damn what the people say, and we have media people and newspaper columnists who don't want to hear what the people have to say either. It's sad. You have worked with Tim Iman a few times in some way or another, haven't you? You've, you've consulted with him at least, is that correct? Uh, I talk to uh, Iman quite a lot. I, uh, he'll usually send me the initiatives he's doing and get my read on wording or ballot title wording uh different provisions stuff like that he's he's a brilliant guy uh understands i think uh a lot about the initiative a lot about the public in terms of opinion and uh what flies and what doesn't and smart guy how long has he been doing uh what he's doing gee whiz i think it's been 20 plus years maybe 30 years uh, close to it. In Washington State, this is actually where I live, uh, he's a 
loved in the hinterlands and hated in uh, King County and uh, and Pierce. Yes, yes, and and uh, you know it's a blue state, and it seems like that the the only uh, non-blue things happening politically are being driven by Tim Iman. And uh, I know a lot of different conservative folks in the state who, and um, you know, a lot of them love him and some of them don't like him at all. And I think part of that is that uh, he steals a lot of the limelight. Um, and, um, but he, you know, I think he's, a, he, he, you know, if, if you're around him, he's self-effacing, you know, he's got a, he's got a, uh, an ego as every person I've ever met does, but, uh, but I think a, a, a very interesting character. Now the journalist you mentioned, uh, you said that it's, did you say it was surprising? You, you were being somewhat ironic there because in a sense, it's not that surprising, right? Uh, sure. It's, it, you know, it, you're not going to fall down. Oh my goodness. A, a journalist who, who is, uh, is not so much in favor of citizen control of government. Uh, which is what it basically boils down to. I mean, to me, it, oftentimes that's the dividing line between regardless of what your politics are or ideology, do you believe in a process where citizens get to weigh in or do you think if you don't like the way they think, you can just take all the decision-making power away from them? Um, but it just it, it just strikes me as odd and, and it should make us fall down. <laughs> um, it, it should make us fall down and and wonder if the world's gone topsy-turvy when someone who's involved in journalism uh the fourth estate uh is is not interested in the citizenry being uh better educated because elections and voting helps to educate people and and frankly doesn't want their input no wonder we have the representative system that we have that is the epitome of unrepresentative. Yeah, this is this is this seems to be part of the whole problem of the what's happened to media these in the last thirty years, right? Uh, I mean, this is just kind of a you know Everett. It's in Everett as well as in Washington D.C. Yes, I, I yes and no. I, I think sometimes it's like sometimes when people discuss the schools, they'll say, "Well, the schools have gotten so much worse," and I, I'm I'm not sure that they've gotten so much worse or that journalism has gotten so much worse. I I think sometimes we have an idealized version or vision of what it used to be. But for instance, with the media, you used to have basically three networks that almost everybody was getting their news from these three networks and you had, you know, the newspapers and, and, you know, there, there were just fewer voices out there from a journalistic aspect, from a, a media business aspect of it. And, and so you weren't going to get the range of opinion and, and different stories that you do today. Um, and I think the, the media presented itself as objective in a way that I think would be laughable today. But I don't think that the media in 1960 when I was born or, or uh, you know, 1980 or 1992 or, or since has really been objective. Uh, I think the gloves have come off. Um, and so it's more obvious that, that our media has a bent and and is pushing a narrative on a regular basis. I mean, I, I've gotten to where, you know, if I read a story in the sports section or the style section of the Washington Post, I'm starting to notice that there's a there's a narrative that's connected sometimes to their to their political narrative, um, and and it just seems to, you know, every every news story. I think that we get a lot more spin about how we're supposed to process it than we do facts to make up our own minds. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, well, maybe 10 years ago, the complaint from the left was that the um, media market has become too monopolistic, that local markets no longer would support two or three newspapers, but just one. But during this time of becoming more monopolistic, the left seems to have seized the monopoly control. 
it's almost relentlessly leftist. Yes, very much so, I think. And, and it seems to have gotten much more that way. For instance, you hear people all the time talk about Fox and how they're slanted. And, and I think there was a time, and they are, um, on the right. But the reason they stand out is because they're the only major network. There's a One America network or something that we I don't get on my cable. Uh, if I'm in Arkansas, where, where uh, my wife and I grew up, um, you know, you, I know that they're on that cable uh, down there. But it's, you know, they're not, a, <clears throat> they're not a huge network. And you've got Sinclair Broadcasting, which owns a bunch of local stations. But there's just a, you know, there's a little bit more of a limit as to, as to that. And then on the, on the left, you've got, and, and it seems to be a more left-left, you've got MSNBC and CNN. And, uh, and you, you pretty much have to put PBS on that, certainly NPR. Uh, I've never, I've never talked to an NPR reporter anywhere in the, in any state or any locality that wasn't on the left, um, which is kind of interesting since it's public and supposed to represent us all somehow. But, uh, but then you also have in newspapers, uh, the Washington Post and the New York Times are so dominant. Uh, and the AP, you know, uh, one of the main AP people, I, I, I'm, uh, Ron Fortney, uh, came out years ago and said, you know, those of us who care about government as the answer, you know, were disserved by something that Obama did that didn't, you know, that, that undercut the trust in government as the answer. Well, it's really helpful to know that the people preparing your news think that government is the big answer. Um, it, it'd be nice to know that because then you can kind of judge where they're coming from. Um, but but almost every paper in this country uh, that as I'm traveling around, I'll see, you know, I'll pick up the local paper. I'm kind of a junkie as far as that goes. And and you'll see almost every national or international story has a Washington Post or a New York Times byline. And so the reach of those two papers is incredible. And the AP, of course, has such reach because everybody's running their stuff. And, and all of them lean left strongly. And then all the television networks lean left strongly. Um, and of course, you, you now have social media and, and uh, you know, we, people can argue back and forth, but, I, but you, you know, I think it's pretty obvious that Google, that, that Twitter, that Facebook all lean left. Um, and you have the left increasingly saying, we need to shut down speech that we don't like. And so, you know, the media ends somewhere there, um, you know, because the media isn't out there saying, hey, we have to shut down speech. But it is really lifting those voices to where, you know, that's, uh, to me, it, it, the idea that on one side, someone believes we ought to have free speech and the other side, uh, someone thinks we should only be able to say things that, that, you know, certain people on the progressive side think are okay to say, uh, I don't think that's much of a debate, and uh, and yet you hear it all the time on TV. Do you see a linkage between uh, the unwillingness uh, to in my state to consult the people, in this case with with the issue at hand, and uh, the unwillingness of the major social media companies to let people they don't agree with speak? I do. I do. I think it's, uh, it, I mean, it, it is the same thing that we, you know, what, what was the, the old joke that, you know, when I want your opinion, I'll beat it out of you. Um, the, the truth is almost everybody says nice things about democracy, but most folks who are political that I run across, uh, most, about most, I think probably over half, they want to win come hooker by hooker by crook. They want a system that produces certain results. And if the system doesn't produce those results, they don't want that system. And I don't mean over the long term, I mean in, to, in the next election. And, uh, and, and so you do, I mean, we, we need all kinds of reforms, but I think a lot of times, 
uh, the reforms are viewed by political people, not the average people, uh, but political people entirely by, will that help me win the issues I most want to win or not? And I, I find this, you know, I'd, I'd like to talk politics and, and you know, in, in where I live, an awful lot of people work for the federal government or work in political, you know, uh, groups or for this party or that congressman or what have you. And, uh, and I find there's a real similarity among the people who are working actively in politics, whether they be right or left, that they tend to, they want the right outcome, however they can get it, and have very little respect or, or interest or knowledge that, wait a second, you know, we really need a process that, that regularly delivers outcomes we can live with. Uh, and yet, and, and I say this because sometimes, you know, you, I explain about initiative referendum and you can see their eyes and their mind working, is this going to help me or not? And then you get the answer and non-political people again and again, you'll see the same process. They're thinking about their main issue. And sometimes they'll even say, well, that might not be so good for me on this issue, on abortion or on guns or on. And then the non-political people oftentimes will say, but it's the right way to do it. I mean, it's the only fair way. It's the democratic way. And, and you know, it, it sounds almost hokey. I've always been a, you know, I believe in right and wrong. And, and I have my own libertarian ideology. But, you know, at, at a certain point, the process does matter. And, and to, to get to decisions in life, political life, that matter to us, um, we need to get there in a way that's not destructive. And democracy, look, if we're, if we're going to the movies and we all decide to go to the movies and hadn't discussed which one we're going to, we're going to have some vote process by which we decide. We're not, you know, one of us isn't going to, you know, punch the other in the face or or try to create some, you know, or bribe one of the other people. I don't know, maybe some friend says, maybe they do bribe somebody. But uh, whether my analogy works there or not, the point is, uh, it's not hokey to think that democracy is a good thing and that having a election process that makes decisions and that is always followed by another election process where the people get to weigh in again, but, you know, if you really don't give a damn what the people think, stop having phony elections. Mm -hmm.